welcome all to Roseworld. Um, I am the Stunted DM. This is my channel, and this is a series on translating a D&D campaign into Foundry. Taking it, this campaign should run from roughly levels one to about three or five, depending on how much content I have for it. And this is just to show people how I do it, and an example of how to translate things and edit things and do we need to do to prepare an actual campaign? Um, so first of all, a couple of caveats on this. Uh, the first one is, I'm assuming you know how to set up a world and add players to your world. And also, this is for 5th edition. Now obviously, it may be translatable. Uh, the stuff you see on here may be useful in other systems. Some of it may be very specific to 5th edition d, &D. Um, but you'll have to kind of look through that yourself and see if you can figure out what's going to be suitable for you. So as you can see here, we've got the main world. So when you load up, this is what you get. I have two modules active. One is um, one for just music, which you can hear in the background because I hate silence. And the other one is just my compendium. Um, this is something I would heavily suggest everyone sets up. Uh, there are some pinned uh, instructions in the Discord, uh, the Foundry Discord, and also there's a couple of really good guys on doing it. The compendium allows you to store things yourself and transfer it from world to world. I see two things I have active. Uh, so what we'll do first of all, we'll do the basics and I'll show you how I set up the base settings, set up a couple of scenes, um, including like a placeholder for a landing page, set up my town and then add NPCs. So first things first, go to my configure settings. So let me have a look, create. So these are usually ticked. It looks like it's unticked them for me. Uh, I like to remove these two options as a GM so that players can't see where my mouse cursor is and also they can't see my, where my mesh room ruler is going. Um, the reason for that is it's basically so that when I'm doing stuff, I can, when it's their turn, I can measure templates out and go, oh, I'm going to be doing this or measure like a monster's movement, things which I'm thinking ahead of for my, my turns. Um, to show where they are, where I am, I use a module called pings, which I'll probably add at some point, but it allows me to click and hold and it will give like a ping on the map to show where I've actually indicated. Um, if you've got a roll 20, it's it's on there um so scrolling status text is quite a new feature for uh, v9 uh, when you apply things like effects to um targets they all get like a a, a scrolling text across the token to say this has been added uh, very video gamey in a way um but it is quite nice about uh, that visual aid to say it's been added and removed Especially if you don't want it popping out into chat. So I'm going to put that on high. Rest, that's fine. System settings. So you've got your rest variants. So as you can see here, you've got the big core one, the gritty uh, epic. I tend to stick with core. Your movement uh, for diagonals, I tend to stick with the, again, core PHB uh, 555. Efficiency variants, uh, there are two to be using. I use bonuses more often, uh, although the DMG dice just look interesting. And then I will remove the weight, uh, disable the experience because I don't tend to use it, and allow polymorphing. Oh yeah. The last one is I like to use max crits. Um, so if you're not sure what this is, um, when you crit uh, with a weapon or spell, you rather than just create rolling two dice what you do is you roll one dice and assume the other dice is maxed so for example if you're using a long sword and you crit you would have two d8s you would assume one of those d8s is an eight and then you would roll the other one and add them together and then add your modifier it makes crits big it makes crits hurt but it also makes them rewarding because there is nothing more gutting as a player to get a crit and roll two ones it is like oh great yeah i, I don't like that so i always remove that um and then currently we don't have any modules so um 
what was it? See here, this canvas here, there's currently nothing I can do on here. These don't work because I don't have any scenes. So these relate to things going on in scenes. Um, these all at the top are useful um, and you'll be using them at certain points. So you've got chat, combat, scenes, uh, actors, items, journals, uh, tables, cards, music, compendiums and settings. I will go through these when we need to use them. For the most, for the moment, we're going to go into scenes. So a scene is, the easiest way to think of it is basically your map or your canvas. So scenes are not only used just for combat maps. They also use a lot for a lot of people in VTTs. Uh, it's really nice to have is that visual aid. So if you have a scene where you want to present them with like a feasting hall, you could describe it. You can, I would suggest still doing it, but you put an image up for that they can all see. It gives them a very visual like indication. Of, oh, that's what we're looking at. So it, it's kind of like, um, what's it, like a splash screen almost, but it allows you to just kind of Put that image up there so this is how i tend to use them i use them in two different ways really so one is just for an image for kind of evoke um basically indication of what i'm trying to get across to them or the exact location if i have art that suits and the other one is for combat maps so what we're gonna do here is um we're gonna create a folder now this one i'm just gonna be called landing and just make it a placeholder I yeah, probably should try spelling it right. Okay. Landing. And I make a quick scene in there called landing. Now, when you create scenes, you can do it in two ways. If you have a folder, you click this button here, and you see it gives you a pop up, and it's audio assigned uh, that scene to that folder you told it to. You rename it. Otherwise, click create scene, and you can select which folder to go into. Uh, so. Uh, I'm not going to do anything with this scene at the moment, it's just there. So that is just so that when I do like a landing page, um, I'll have that. So a landing page, if you're not aware, quite common in VTTs at the moment, and they're really quite nice. It's basically a main menu. I think of it like that as from like a video game where you have that screen that you sit on. Uh, there are a background image, some music playing, some atmosphere to it, give you an indication of what you're looking to. And there's usually like um, some options, like some links. So what I tend to have is like one that allows players to access uh, um, a page that has like tokens and character sheets and stuff. Um, one that has maps, allow them to go to a page where they can see different maps they need to, or the main area maps they need to. And uh, one that might have a, like a journal or um, a law book, allowing them to record stuff on there, things like that. I want to do that now. I'll do that at a later on date. For now, I'm going to get a nice rosy colour. Make it nice bright. This is going to be called Rose World. So I'm going to make my town on here. Again, I cannot spell today. Rose World. Right, so I'm going to make a new scene, and this one's again going to be called. Uh, this one's going to be called Town. So we'll go through this now. So first of all, you can see when you create scenes, you get them on this here. You can minimize it, open it. Um, this little bullseye target tells you what scene is active. And the little icon there you can see relates to the players down here. And it tells you what scene everyone's on. So as a GM, you can see where everyone is. So if someone's lost on the scene that shouldn't be, then the way around it. And you can pull them to a scene. So you can go there. So, for example, one there, there's usually an option to say, like, pull to scene. Um, what is it on this one? Yeah, there's usually an option to do that. Um, setting them up, we have here. So, this is the name, which uh, you see. You can set this to show all people or just you. So, this is the navigation pane. If this is unticked, this won't appear on here. Um, I mean, it, it, you can't see it on the navigation. Um, I tend to leave it ticked so I can see the town, the names, and you can have as many scenes open as you like. Uh, I believe they're just spread across the top here. 
I tend not to have too many because it can like you don't want to have all this loading time unless you think you're going to be transitioning to different scenes uh, within your session. Um, navigation name you can rename it so for example if you had planned a cityscape and you had like a murder that was going to happen in an alleyway you might put for the dm alleyway murder scene but for players you might just put alleyway that way you're not giving it away so the, the navigation name is what will the players will see um it will show up in there so you know what it's called you know the specification of it so you can quickly access it who have to play so they won't know what it is um background images are what you're generally going to be using to place your image on the map uh, background color i tend to use black um initial position uh, that allows you to set so when you load the scene up it will load onto that like specific location each time uh grid so I don't want mine to be there so you by standard it comes with square you can set it gridless or hex because i'm not making a combat map i don't need to care about distances so i'm going to make it gridless simple as that there's no need for anything um but when you're going to be playing like a combat map you want to put your grids down uh, your grid size you can specify here uh, so I know a lot of people, if they come from like Roll20, a lot of maps Roll20 were designed with, uh, I think it was 70 um, pixels per square. So you, if you have a map, you can adjust that and then you can match it up with your uh, the grid, if it becomes gridded. Um, I would always suggest if you can, get a gridless map, but obviously sometimes it's not always possible. The image dimensions, obviously it tells you the um, image is going to be set to padding gives you a little bit of um, canvas space behind your grid scale this is where you define your distances so if you want to say use a giant hole you might go actually i want each square to be 10 foot so you know that every time someone moves into a square it's a 10 foot square rather than five foot things like that you can also do how um obvious the grid is and the color of the grid um, lines so on this one obviously it's black there your lighting so token vision so when you when we set tokens up you'll see that you can set vision to them and tell them this is what they can see and the radius they can see around them if this is set on here when that token is dropped onto that scene they'll automatically be limited to what the token says they can see uh, i don't need that so i'm going to remove it I don't need any fog exploration anyway, so I'm going to move that. Um, darkness, uh, so unrestricted token range, vision range, basically means that, um, as it says there, you can read it. Uh, if a token has line of sight, it can see as it, far as it can see, um, rather than limit, limiting it. Um, but yeah, it's kind of useful. Uh, I tend to use those a lot later. Uh, darkness level so if you want to simulate a change in lighting so if you want to go from sunset to dusk you drag that bar and the darkness level will creep in uh, you can do this on like uh, town scenes as well if you want to simulate the evening times which is quite cool um, and you can add like lighting effects to locations to simulate activity again which is quite nice to have that kind of functionality if you want to go down that route and you can also limit the threshold with darkness there. And then ambience is you can tie things to a journal entry, uh, a, a uh, playlist, and weather effects, which you got these options here. So for now, I'm going to go background image. So one thing I would heavily suggest is when you are setting up your files, whether this is on the Forge, which I use, or if it is um, self-hosted, make your foothold paths useful and make sense. Uh, as you can probably saw back there, this is from my Curse of Draw game and it's all over the place. Uh, with Rosewald, I am trying to keep everything all in one location uh, within folders so I can access things quickly and easily and when I need to. So this one I've got Town of Rosewald, and this is my map for Rosewald. You can see I've already up up uploaded um, some NPC art, which we'll get to in a moment. 
for now. Go select. And then we can say save. Yes. Now you see, nothing's changed there, oddly enough, until you realise I'm not on the active scene. And here's Rose World. So here's my starting town. Um, this is made in uh, Wonder Draft. I tend to use a lot of Wonder Draft and Dungeon Draft. You will see that in the maps that I make going forward um, that I add onto the files. Uh, they're all made in Wonder or Dungeon Draft. Um, quite a few of them are then touched up in GIMP. I'm not good at it, but I can um, do bits and pieces. So you can see here uh, the roads, the um, contours for the hill here. Uh, they were all done in GIMP, and so were the markers dominated in certain locations. Um, those I'll get to in certain, uh, a later date. But for now, that's the town of Rosewald. So what I'm going to do, I am going to configure this to say, when this page loads, I want to get to this, uh, to this view there. So, that is Rosewald. Um, next thing to guess is to start on NPCs. So, um, you would have thought I would do actors and create all my NPCs there. I'm not going to, because a lot of the NPCs I have, there's no need to have tokens for them. Some I will do. Uh, so, for example, like guards, the captain of the guard, uh, maybe the reeve. Um, those will have tokens that can be used in actual combats. I don't feel the need to make tokens for everything. So for the most part, I'm going to make in journal entries. It's a lot easier, it makes more sense, and it just um, works better in that regards. So what we're going to do is we'll make a, a, again, a folder. When I colour this, we'll go kind of pale blue on this one. Definitely the colour at all, you can leave it as it is. I, some, it's useful quickly if you know like all my NPCs are this colour, and you can quickly look on there when you have multiple folders. MP MPCs and then click here. I'm completing the wrong one, aren't I? Let's delete that. I should be in the journal. There we go. Something to bear in mind, folks. Look where you're typing. <laughs> um, PCs. Okay, now I'm in the journal entry. So again, if I click here. You see there, uh, so my first one, let's see who my first NPC is. Okay, so my first one is Sir Augustus. So Sir Augustus Glorosk. So what we'll do here is got, so this opens a um, journal entry. So I've already built these NPCs out, so I've got all this text here. Let's save, let's save that. So actually what I do need to do is go here. So your players won't see these journal entries unless you allow them to. So you can go to configure per, uh, permissions and you can change it to say, so this is a player I've added. You can tell them, oh, they want to be able to see it. If you don't change those permissions, it is viewable by DM only, or GM only. Uh, so I don't need to worry about my players accidentally seeing all this information about an NPC. So all I've got here is um, basic information, where he usually is, uh, a brief description of him, how his relationships are with the party and with the town, a couple of role-playing aspects on how I would look to play him. Some of it is a little bit weird, I may have said before, I'm still relatively new, but um, that would be kind of like, I'm going to say a slight hint, hint of a sailor, probably using more slang kind of terms. Uh, background of where he um, comes from, just so I got that information. A couple of information what he can do, so he can offer things, uh, how he can help the players out, and some goals he has. Now what I do is I'm going to add an image, so if we go to that tab there. I go to my file, so I'm going to go to PCs and go for Sir Augustus. And there's my Sir Augustus. And then I can save entry. 
So if I click on this, uh, this would show the player as this, and the same as the image. If I wanted to show them, this is what he looks like. And you can see this is what um, the. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import my NPCs. Um, I'll be back in just a moment. I don't want you to sit here and watch me do this for all of them, because that'd be bold as fuck. So two seconds. Here we go. So here are my NPCs, uh, my main ones in the town. Um, see, we've got three of them, got all the information. What image? Uh, so, what I'll do is um, the artwork for each of these I will put links to in the document I am preparing to go alongside this series so that I'm not claiming any of this is my work at all. I can't draw for shit. So, I have sourced these from online using them without permission but i am going to also refer to them and say here's the credits for it um so yeah we'll go through them briefly so most of these are so i will be going through and doing more with these guys in a later uh, episode which will probably be next one I just want to show you what they all look like, just so you get an idea. Uh, right, let's see, so Augustus. Uh, this is how I set them up, this is the information I've got for them, and this is what I'll be doing with them going forward. So what will happen with these, they will be linked to the um, location itself. So that to you, um, when I come into something, I will be able to quickly um, access that location and see who's there. So in the case of, I'll have a journal entry and I'll be making it a clickable uh, link in there so I can click it and that journal entry will pop open. So it saves me having to go from one folder to another and try and figure that shit out. Um, so with these, you can drop the journals onto the map. I'll show you briefly there. So we do this, so you do all, has all these options. Uh, again, people won't see this. It'll be just for you. But if you hover over it, it'll tell you the name. Double click and it'll pop it open for you. Um, I'm not going to use this for the NPCs on this instance. Uh, this will be more for locations that will be bound to these areas here. Um, I think that'll probably do it for this episode. Like I said, I want to keep them quite short. Um, it's just to show you what I'm doing, how I'm going about this, how I'm transferring this. You may or may not find this useful. I really hope some people do. Um, and I hope it's not um, too much sure of sucking eggs. But for some of you, it is just to show you the basics of how you go about this and what you do with setting up um, your initial starting area and starting world within Foundry. So next week I'll be coming back, uh, I will be doing the locations, uh, linking them with the NPCs, and then I'll be starting on setting up the um, shops and stuff like that. One thing I want to say on that, I'll probably go into it next week as well, I don't tend to make scenes for shops unless I feel the need to do so. So these will be introducing, introducing um, a first couple of modules. Um, aside from the ones I've already got, uh, like I said, just for music and stuff, but it'll be to introduce those and show how I will be using these on this game uh, to set this up. Um, but yeah, I think that'll do it for this week. Um, thanks a lot for watching. I hope you found any of this kind of useful and it wasn't too much um, repetitive and basic stuff, but thanks, thanks, what, thanks a lot for watching and I will see you all in the next video.